Hi everyone, good evening. It's Nishti here, dietitian, and I'm going to be um, asking Dr. Costa to join us for a live chat on how we can test and should we test children who are allergic to cow's milk protein allergy or who have cow's milk protein allergy. So let me just add him. Um, children's. There we go. Oh, almost there. Invite. Okay, that should hopefully work. Hi, Dr. Costa. Hi, sorry, camera was the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it worked because it says that my internet is not very powerful this evening, so hopefully it should be okay. Is it? Uh, okay. Thank you so much for taking It's going to be time okay, out. definitely. Sorry? It's definitely going to be okay. Great, great. I love your Buddha in the background. I have my Buddha here as well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I'm so glad Hi. that you've taken time out today because, you know, calcium protein allergy is very dear to my heart. And obviously you are an allergy specialist so it would be lovely to talk about calcium and protein allergy but particularly you know mm -hmm. testing children uh, and okay. do we need to test them so i'm sure there's going to be a lot of people who are interested to ask questions i have a few questions here but for our mm -hmm. audience if you want to ask any questions um, please go ahead and we'll do our best to answer your questions um so i was thinking um dr costa maybe to <laughs> We need to explain what is cow's milk protein allergy, don't we? Because maybe someone uh, won't know what it is. Well, you, you know, first of all, we need to, to differentiate between the two types of milk allergy. Uh, but mainly, it is, it is an allergy that the onset is normally within the, two first, the first two weeks of life. So it is very uncommon that it, it appears after one year of age. So after that one, we need to look into other sources. And basically, like any other food allergy, it represents itself, especially when it is the immediate effect of IG mediated. It starts with the, the onset of sometimes swellings, hives, vomiting or immediate vomiting. And those are the main problems because it's very rare that on first exposure, you're going to have signs of anaphylaxis. That is a later stage. So it's a normal, you're going to look into the normal typical signs of a food allergy. Allergy. So the swellings, the hives, uh, the vomiting, those are the main things that you need to look into. If it is non-IG mediated, so the delayed type, you're going to look into gastrointestinal, so either constipation or diarrhea, leading to eczema, and uh, eventually leading to reflux as well. Right, and which one do you think is, more, is the most common one? <laughs> Problem is that a lot of them that the self-diagnosis comes to mumble all of this. So the non-IG is more frequent than IG. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to look into the data worldwide, there's massive variations of the incidence. And you're going to find incidence of something as, as low as 1.8%, so actually quite significant, to as high in certain places of nearly 10%. The, the, it is said that the average... Of, uh, of milk allergy, being it IG or non-IG, is around 2.5% worldwide. So, so if you're going to see, it affects around 140 million people worldwide. Gosh, you know, I feel like every baby has calcium protein allergy, but maybe it's because we see them, right? But it's just so common, yeah. isn't it? Um, and, I mean, for the non-IGE, it particularly personally I see a lot of them so and they always ask should I get tested and and I think it's such an important topic and um, so what mm. what how would you now that we've differentiated between the IG and the non IGE mm. which one do we test and do we do we test that's the question okay non IG no there are no tests for non-IG, so, so for the delayed ones, there's no tests. There's no point in doing anything, anything at all about that, investigations-wise. Is there a point in talking to someone like you, a dietitian, because they are the most helpful people to help people, to help patients with this. For IG, so the immediate effect ones, yes, we need to test. 
to identify if it is really that. And often we also test for soya because there can be a cross-reactivity between the protein in one and the protein in the other. Just so, just in case we do it, but also if it is truly a milk allergy and if soya is negative, it's always a good uh, replacement for cow's milk uh, protein. So another, another milk that we can choose. Yes, but I feel like a lot of parents would want to get a test, even if it's non-IGE, no matter what you say. Um, and even when I explain to them that actually there is no test and the test is to eliminate it and then put it back in the diet and then see, it, it doesn't really, it, it doesn't help. However, I try and explain it. Why do you think that is? Why do parents want to get their children tested, even if it's non-IGE? Well, one of them is fear. Fear of a more significant reaction, uh, even if all the signs are there. Also, um, sometimes social media doesn't come to help on this one, and Google even worse. Because whenever you do that, what you're going to search, or what is going to appear on the search, are the worst signs. And people are afraid, very, very afraid. But also they think about because they had it or a sibling had it or someone else had it, and they think that the, that incidence is so high that they want the child to be tested. So in reality, the incidence is very low. And uh, as you know, there's no genetical relationship between parents having a milk allergy and their children having a milk allergy as well. So there's no gene identified for that. Uh, so I, I think that that's their main thing, the main reason for them to ask for that to be done is fear yes yes and i think i agree with you there because you can you can, and you can understand it is scary when you've seen your child have a uh, an allergic reaction mm. uh, we've got lots of people join so please feel free to ask questions to dr costa um related to milk allergy or i guess any other type of allergy you might as well now that you're here to you know go ahead and ask questions <laughs> How about if a child? How about if a child has milk allergy, but then also reacted to egg, and it's non-IgE? Would you recommend a testing then? Not at all. Okay. There's no relationship between uh, milk protein and egg protein. Completely different proteins. Yeah. Uh, and as you said, egg is one of the four foods that we know that can lead to non-IgE symptoms. The other two being soya and wheat. So again, no tests. And uh, I often get patients that went to, through something called the York test, which is not advisable, is not proven to be effective, because in reality, what they're testing, the, the, the basis for something like a York test is a, a, a immunoglobulin called IgG4, which basically tells you what you have been eating, not what you're allergic to. So I would say I would advise against having something like that. Thank you for clarifying that. I think we've had a question. Oh, if my child is two and reacted to a tiny bit of malted milk biscuit, when do I resume the milk ladder? It if depends my... on the... Yeah. Depends if the child is IgE or non-IgE. Yes. Uh, Can you clarify that? I'm not sure who, what your name is. Is your so child the... IgE or non-IgE? So if it is IgE then we need to consider were there tests previously done that were positive or not um, and because in a case like that if it is positive and the child is now reacting to it probably the child would need the first steps then in hospital yeah i'll probably would not retest unless if the test previously was negative and now the child is reacting and it is ig reactions not non-ig reactions because if it is non-ig reactions normally i say look delay the reintroduction of that six to eight weeks and then try it again yes i and i do the same because this is very common um, i'm sorry i don't know what your name is but it's very common uh, that children may react and then you just have a bit of a break and then you go back and try again but it's so Absolutely. different for every child so it's so hard to give a concise answer isn't it dr costa yeah, yeah but, but also think about this. I've had patients that all the history is consistent with having an IgE milk allergy. But between the symptoms uh, and the appointment, they decide to restrict uh, milk on the child's diet or even their own diet. And 
that period of time when it is so delayed sometimes can allow the child to outgrow the allergy. Right. So don't be confused if suddenly a child had a milk allergy and comes to a clinic and we say, look, at the moment, the test is negative. It's not because it is a false negative. Very often it's because the delay is enough for the child to outgrow their allergy. Love that. That's so interesting. That's so interesting. Um, okay, so Naimi says, counts... Counts, is there anything you can do to help kids outgrow CMPA? Counts, I'm not sure, I think that's a spelling mistake, but is there anything we can do to help children outgrow cow's milk protein allergy? Yes, milk leather. Yeah. So, and, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. So, uh, you know, and there's two milk leathers, the, the, the 6 and 12 step. Yeah. The 6 step is a more recent one, uh, probably about, three years old or something like that. Yeah. Personally, I still work with the 12 step. I, I like it more. Uh, for people to understand why one was changing to the other is because there were fears of the, um, uh, of the sugar content on the 12 step milk ladder. Uh, but what I've found is my patients will outgrow their milk algae faster if they are uh, on a 12 step than on a six step. Right. Actually, I have a lot of bounce backs the bounce backs yeah. on, the, on the six step. Yes, I mean, I personally, I, I don't use the six step either. I, I think it's too quick. It, it's not very yeah. mindful. So um, I'm with you there. I think the 12 step is, it makes more sense. Um, and, and, and looking at them, I think that for instance, the first two or three steps are very big jumps. Yes. While you go to the last few steps and the jumps is very small. Yes. So I don't think that there is a, a good consistency in the variation of how the protein is degraded for you to go from one step to the other. So, yeah. you know, I just prefer to go on the, 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 the 12 steps still. Yeah, I'm with you there. Um, but uh, Naimi, if you, oh, she's asked something else. My child has IgE allergy to many things, including milk. When... When do you? When will we see kids outgrow allergies if they will do so? And also, I think more is coming. So let's do this mm -hmm. one first. <laughs> <laughs> when will we see kids outgrow allergy, basically, for IgE? Okay, uh, that is a very broad question because there's a lot of IgE allergies. So if you're going to focus just on the milk allergy, um, Previously, all data would suggest that around 65% of children will outgrow the milk algae by the age of two, two years old. Uh, more recent data has decreased that percentage to around 50% or less. So, but we are still expecting that uh, around 80% of children with a milk allergy will outgrow their allergy uh, by the age of five or six. So, and then there's a smaller percentage that will never outgrow their algae, being it IgE or non-IgE mediated. So, greater chance of restriction and starting a milk leather is for the ones that started very early and they might, might outgrow it by two years of age. Wow, that was a very lovely, concise answer. Naomi, I, I hope that was helpful for you. I think there's more coming because she's put and also, but I can't read um, the rest. But there is another question here, um, Dr. Costa, from uh, Mary Carls. Don't you find people get stuck for longer on the 12-step ladder? People reading into symptoms that were co coincidental. <laughs> uh, well, my experience is not. Mm -hmm. uh, you you have some children that on the sixth step will cruise through, and I would guess that those ones will also cruise on the twelfth step. So the difference between one and the other will not be significant. On the other hand, I, I I've seen exactly the opposite: the ones delaying far more the reintroduction of getting to the highest steps of the milk on the sixth step than than on the twelfth step. So I've seen this, this difference between one and the other. So my suspicion is, is it possible for me to go and do a six step and not grow and then go and do the 12 steps? So there's no proper comparison point. But is my, is, is mainly observational for what I've seen so far. Uh, it seems to me that 12 step works better. Right, right. I think, I mean, if, if you don't mind, um, I just want to add to that. Uh, 
you know, it's so important to work with someone as well because you can just make up a lot of different symptoms, you know, and I think that's why you need to be working with, with someone who, who could help you. Um, but also, you know, from per personally, I sometimes advise to jump from maybe two to four, like it's never one, two, three, four, five, it could be one, three, uh, f five, and then, so it depends from child yeah. to child, doesn't it, Dr. Cross? Exactly, because people, one of the things that people need to understand is every child is different. Yeah. So every child is going to react in a different way. Every child is going to have different symptoms if they have any symptoms. So trying to compare that child to another child that was on a milk ladder is, is not wise because you, you're going to get into mistake. So yeah. don't do it. Yes, and I, I feel a lot of parents also feel devastated if their child had failed the milk ladder when actually they may just be outgrowing their allergy a little bit slower in comparison to someone else. So... You know, it's, as, as, as I like to say, stay in your own lane because everyone's lane is different. Yeah. But also, as you say, they need support. And that is, uh, unfortunately, what is not happening often is that they don't have enough support. And sometimes a certain child might have a symptom that p parents will think it is associated with the, with the milk. So, and very often it's not. It's completely unrelated and if they don't have anyone to clarify that is going to induce even more confusion and therefore they their frustration of the child taking longer to go into the next step yes and and can i just add to that because i had someone who um at once i can't remember what step it was and she said oh my child is reactive but then when we looked at the diet the child was having a lot of beans that week and obviously huh? beans is high in FODMAP, so it's a natural prebiotic yeah. and it was causing, you know, gas and a little bit of constipation. So there can always be other foods because, you know, with children, you're reintroducing lots of new foods. Of course. And they could be potential triggers as well. But and, and also the other thing that to bear in mind, and I always tell the parents that I see is that, remember, the most important thing that happens more frequently in a child viral infections because the immune system is building up and of course viral infection and the symptoms associated with the viral infection sometimes comes at the same time that someone is trying to introduce a new food or introducing a ladder being it the milk ladder the soy ladder the egg ladder yeah. and then the, the overlapping symptoms and the coincidence then are, are too big again if they have someone to advise them they can try to differentiate between one and the other yes yes it's never straightforward is it with kids <laughs> no never that's why they kids so here's a question um from Ailish who says why can some cmpa tolerate goat's milk formula i have seen this certain times <clears throat> she's a dietitian actually hi Ailish. so why so, can some tolerate goat's milk? that is that is a very odd thing the the only thing that we might consider being there um, so goat's milk is 98% similar to cow's milk, first of all. But what we have is a higher concentration of casein instead of whey. So the only thing that I can suspect is, is that child having a whey allergy and not a casein allergy and therefore changing into goat's milk with a lower whey concentration. That is one of the reasons why they, they don't react. Because people need to also bear in mind that the reaction to an allergen is dependent on volume and concentration so therefore if you're giving less volume or less concentration lesser side effects so lesser reactions is it that potentially gosh that was really good nice and concise Ailish, i hope that answered your question i'm sure you're seeing lots of um, babies with exactly that problem um oh there are so many other questions hold on um so claire says my son is six, IgE to milk and egg. Needed EpiPen for milk one year ago. Still positive, SPT, bloods. Will we need a negative SPT to even start the milk ladder? We have never tried it. Okay. I'm going to pre probably be the bearer of bad news. And likely at that age to outgrow the IgE allergy. Okay. Very, very unlikely. The longer, the longer someone takes to outgrow an IgE allergy, right. the higher the chance that that person or that child is not going to outgrow the, the, 
the death allergy. So if they're still very positive and there's not been able to introduce anything at all into the child's diet, mainly baked, because we know that if you manage to introduce baked egg, like, or, uh, sorry, baked milk or baked egg into someone that is allergic to that, they have a very, very good chance, roughly around 95% chance of outgrowing that allergy. But if they do not tolerate the baked form, then what you're talking about is that child is allergic to the stable protein in that allergen. And the stable protein, you now very rarely people will outgrow it. So what should she do then now? What should Claire do? Should she... Um, one of the things that I do, when I see that the child is taking a little bit longer, mm. there's a specific test that I like to do called component diagnostics. Because I like to know which protein in specific, from all the proteins that exist, which protein in specific is that child allergic to. And if it comes back strongly positive to the protein that is heat stable, then, you know, as I said, normally I tell parents, this is the reason why, and it is unlikely to outgrow the allergy. Right. Okay, Claire, I hope that answered your question. So maybe you could DM Dr. Costa directly, because uh, I think that would, might help you. Um, but please ask away if you have any further questions. And I think I'm just trying to make sure I haven't missed anything. Oh, here's another one from Luanas, who says, Hi, Dr. Costa. My son has high IgE to almonds and several foods. However, he can eat almond-based products. What is the typical explanation? Is there a chance he tolerates other food he's allergic Okay, it, it depends on what age the child had, had the blood test done. So research says that if you do a, a specific Ig to a food below two years of age, the rate of false positives is extremely high. So I've had, I've had a while ago one of my patients that came from quite far away, not living in the country, uh, that where they living, he was tested for Ig foods and came a panel of around 30-odd foods that he was allergic to. Mother, very wisely, said, well, why is this coming positive? And they are telling me to exclude it when my child actually never reacted to this. So, and she continued to give the foods and came to me because there was a suspicion of two or three that she didn't know, and this, those are the only ones that she did exclude. And I did skin prick tests. And guess what? Everything came back negative. So is it that that is happening? Because, you know, also people need to understand a very important thing. Mm -hmm. Not everyone that is that has either a skin prick test or blood test positive for a food mean that they are allergic to the food. I, I think this is so important. Can we repeat that and maybe do a post about it? Because I think it comes up every day. I'm having the main... every day. Uh, absolutely, because people need to understand a very important thing. The only test that is 100% accurate is eating the food. Yeah. That is the only test that is 100% accurate. If you eat the food and the child does not react, the child is not allergic. There is no point in continuing to do tests. And then what I emphasize is give the food uh, several times a week, normally two or three times a week, to maintain tolerance. Do not assume immediately that because a skin prick test or the blood test is positive, that the child is allergic. And that is why normally I restrict the tests that I do, and I do skin prick tests, it's rarely that I do blood tests. I restrict the tests that, that I do to either the food that we are suspecting that the child has reacted to, or if there's a protein that is related to that food that they reacted. Otherwise, I prefer not to test because if it comes a false positive, then what? Yes. Then we're going to needlessly exclude the food from a child that potentially is not allergic to. This happens, I think this happens more than we know. I wonder if there's some research out there to suggest how, how much and how many people exclude unnecessarily, you know, foods from their children's diets because of well, an allergy test. The so, problem is also, it depends on the allergies that they've seen. Mm -hmm. Because each allergist have their, have their own idea of how to deal with the food allergy. And you still have allergists, they say, okay, you are allergic to one food, exclude an massive amount of foods. And the other ones, which is my case, I tell to introduce the ones that they're not reacted to. 
Yeah. Okay, so it yeah. it varies. So that opinion can come on both ends. Right, right. I I just think this is such an important topic because you know children have unique nutritional requirements and to unnecessarily eliminate a food group or a food is no need. You have to be very Without... careful. So yeah. So thank you for that. I I, I absolutely love that. Um. If you guys are enjoying it, make sure you hit the like button and ask away. We have more questions here. Uh, oh gosh, let me go back. Don't you find, oh no, that's that one we've already. I'm having to go back, Dr. Costa, to make sure I. Uh... Go on, sometimes there's a lot of them. So many. Let me just make sure that, because we had, I had a few in my inbox as well. So I want to make sure, because they couldn't join the live. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Um, so. Can you test for lactose intolerance? Okay. Um, there are tests. Not all of them are very conclusive. There's, there's one thing called the hydrogen breath test and there's stool for reducing substances. Now, the problem about lactose intolerance uh, is it is so overestimated, it is unbelievable. The incidence of true lactose intolerance is around 0.4% or something like that. Yes. Okay. The countries currently, the countries with the highest incidence of lactose intolerance, nearly a hundred percent is something like South Korea. Right, right. So, so the, the, the countries around China, they evolved to lose the gene that produces lactase, which is the, the enzyme that degrades lactose. So, and this is because cows farming, which is something more common in Europe, is not very frequent there. And you're going to see that in, in Northern Africa as well. Uh, cows farming is not very frequent, is, is more frequent as meat or trade, and the milk is used to grow new uh, calves. Okay, so those countries over there, the incidence is, is massive. It used in, in Europe, the one that had the highest incidence of lactose intolerance was, was Finland. So most of the papers that you're going to find in Europe about lactose intolerance are from Finland. Mm -hmm. So uh, testing it, you're going to find sometimes components in, in a child that is not lactose intolerant, you're going to find components in, in, the, in the pool that are the ones that you would find on a lactose intolerance. But that sometimes has to do with the amount that the child has eaten or because the, 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 what is called the gastric transit, so the, 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 the speed at which something that is eaten and comes out has been so fast that it has not had time to be processed. So, for instance, a child that has liquid stool, the transit is very fast. So sometimes not all of the sugars are going to be digested and it's going to come the other way. Yeah. Okay, so uh, can be tested, yes. Would I advise testing it? No, unless it has already a known family history of lactose intolerance. In each, that case, well, what we call a, a, a genetical or inherited lactose intolerance. Yes, you know, I'm gonna send this lady a, a post about it uh, because it could be causal protein allergy that's confused for lactose intolerance. As we know, is uh, that's always the case, isn't it? Um, yeah, de definitely, because very often, as you say, is the non-IGE mediated that people think it is lactose intolerance. Yeah. And a while ago, I, I was speaking to, there's a professor called Professor Claire Mills in, in Manchester, and I was asking her, why does she think that someone that goes on a lactose-free formula will have less symptoms of non-IGE mediated cosmic protein allergy? And, and she thinks that probably one of the reasons of that is the way that the milk is processed and the growth of other probiotics in the gut. Right. But, but interestingly, and now again, what comes to lactose intolerance, and this comes to an article that we recently spoke about, people need to bear in mind that re recent evidence yes. shows that children that go on a lactose-free formula have a higher, a much, much higher incidence of obesity in later years. Because the way that they, they, they replace the lactose, which is a sugar, is by normally by corn syrup. And that causes addiction. Yes, yes. And so also something... lactose, lactose will enhance or increase bifidobacteria in the gut. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to 
very excluded from a child's diet, if you don't know. Absolutely, absolutely. And if so you something have lactose to consider. doesn't mean you have lactose intolerance. But I think this, that's, that's a whole other topic, isn't it? That we could talk an hour about that. Well, yeah, and, and what it comes to, for instance, and that is why, for me, when I prescribe extensively hydrolyzed formulas or amino acid formulas, I prefer to go to the ones that have lactose in it, not the ones that do not have lactose. Yes, and also it makes them taste better anyway, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, okay, we have another one here. Hi, I've omitted egg from my diet for 12 months as my little one has IgE positive for egg. But when I tried baked egg myself twice, my throat was really itchy and I had a bad stomach and felt sick. Is this normal? So she must be breastfeeding, I, I assume, this mom. Okay. If, if she was eating egg in baked, non-baked forms uh, until then, and she had no problems, uh, the likelihood of developing an egg allergy at that stage is low. Saying this, one of the conditions that can alter the allergic status in a human being is pregnancy, so affects women, basically. Yeah. That is one of them, because the, 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 the stress on the immune system is so radical that a lot of women, and I have quite a few mothers that, that, that has happened, that things that they were allergic to and they were eating through pregnancy, suddenly they become allergic to. So yeah. that is one of the reasons why. Is this what is happening to her? And therefore, that tolerance has decreased because she suddenly excluded egg from the diet? Is, is possible. In that case, I would suggest that she needs to have skin prick tests as soon as possible to find out if she's truly allergic or not. Great. great. I hope that answers your question. Um, breastfeeding mama, I think that was. Uh, and then this one is from Kirsty. Oh, <laughs> uh, and then this one is Kirsty who says... My four-year-old suffered anaphylaxis after eating a yogurt. She's had dairy for four years until severe reaction. Right. Did, did you understand that? So it was age so four she had the reaction. So she had dairy up until then, and then she had a severe reaction. An anaphylactic reaction to yogurt when they had dairy until then? Well... Could you explain a bit more, Kirsty? We, we, um, Maybe we could get a bit more info. What info would you need from her, um, Dr. Costa? You, the only, it's to find out how much dairy the child was having and how, how was it. And also, uh, was they having any signs whatsoever? Because what, what happens sometimes is that um, some children are tolerating small amounts, and sometimes there are signs that come associated that people normally think, no, this is not a milk allergy and there's something else going on. So it completely goes uh, undercover until it comes to a point that the immune system just decides to have a significant allergic reaction. So unless if the child has been tested before uh, and it was either negative or positive, it's difficult to find out what is happening at that point. Unless if the child... Uh, was tolerating, for instance, was on a milk ladder, went to the top of the milk ladder, and then suddenly uh, uh, having a yogurt triggered it. Because also, uh, remember I said about an allergic reaction is dependent on the concentration and volume. So those are the two main factors. But another thing that will lower the threshold at which someone is going to react are things like a viral illness, not sleeping well, having done exercise, anything that can affect the immune system and lower the immune system threshold can lead to a reaction to an amount that previously was tolerated. And that is a study that was done a few years ago in Cambridge that they proved that. That's significant. She actually says that um, her child has eczema. Eczema flare-up, she says, Kirsty. Okay. Yes. Okay, so very likely... The problem is that she confirmed this allergy with skin prick test. Sorry, I'm just reading. Was yeah. tolerating all dairy onto the severe reaction. Okay, okay, yeah. So the skin, as she, she, the child had skin prick test. Yes, and it was confirmed. But so, before or after the reaction? Uh, let me check. 
She had no severe reaction until this particular reaction. To, she's confirmed milk allergy with skin prick test. I'm not sure when, though. I'm not sure okay. when. If it, if it was before if the, the, the reaction, then I, I don't know what kind of advice she was given uh, for the milk to continue to be given. Yes. Um, yeah. Because th then, then uh, after reaction, ah, okay. So the the skin protect was after the reaction, okay. Okay. So 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 very often, what what probably what happened is, um, by having flare ups of eczema, probably was initially thought that it probably was a non IG mediated allergy, and the child continued to have milk. Probably uh, that's what I can suspect. And if it is that the case, uh, then. Is the problem that sometimes an IG milk algae can manifest itself just as something like that, as a flare up of an eczema? And in that case, very likely the child has a mixed component of IG and non IG. So, wouldn't she need to start the milk lab at some point then, Kirsty? Uh, so, in, in, the, in this case, um, the child would need a period of time without having any there in the, in, in the child's diet. Okay. And then eventually, repeating the skin prick test to see if there has been a decrease in the size of the wheel to see if the child was then a candidate for, for a foot challenge or not. And what sort of time frame is that, Dr. Costa? <sighs> At least six months. Okay. At least six months. Because Very often on, on, on more question. severe reactions, I probably go, go for around 12, but six months at least. And then there is another one here. Is there a way? Is there a way I can? So Freya says, "Is there a way I can find out what milk protein, whey, or casein my little one is allergic to?" Yeah, blood test. Blood can do test. blood test. Component, component diagnostics. And that's or component that's resolve the diagnostics, as they like to call it in the lab. Okay, I hope that answers your question, Freya. Um, Okay, now I still have two, I'm sorry, I still have two, uh, two more questions here. My son is almost two, oh, two years old and was tested positive for egg and wheat when he was one. Does he need another test? Yeah. Yeah, and also I would say to her, is he really allergic to these foods, as you mentioned, isn't it? You know, the, the, for, because... Doing one skin prick test is like we have a one event in time. With that that one, I cannot predict which way the child is going. So I, if there's a skin prick test done, it is positive, exclusion of that food. Repeat the skin prick test. In this case, I'll probably repeat it in six months. And then see, is it stable? Is it higher? Is it lower? And that will guide me to tell parents what is the, the, the next step. And also, what is the likelihood that the child outgrowing or not outgrowing the allergy? Right. Okay, so repeated skin prick tests? Yes, definitely so. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, let me just make sure here I'm clicking on the other. Oh, gosh, I think I've missed some. Okay. My child has IgE allergy to many things. Oh, no, we've answered that one. Okay, last question uh, for everyone watching. Thank you for watching, of course, and for all your questions. Um, make sure you ask your questions as soon as possible because I'm mindful and we're keeping Dr. Costa on for like hours. Uh, so how about dairy allergy in adults? Can I get tested for this? I assume this is an adult who's struggling with dairy products. Okay. Um, the development of, as I said, except on cases like pregnancy, people that are immunocompromised and needed chemotherapy and radiotherapy, or uh, high-intensity uh, athletes, adults do not develop new allergies. So basically, what allergies you've got until you are around six years of age is what you're going to have. After that, you're not going to have any. The only things, the only exclusions there are for instance, um, someone that has never tried the food and they only try it when they are 20, 30 or 40. Of course, that is the first exposure. So they, they, they were never aware if they were allergic or not. So that is not a new allergy. It's an allergy that has been present all their lives, but only manifests itself when they first had the food. 
Okay? Now, if someone later in life as an adult thinks that they have an allergy, uh, it, it is something to discuss with an allergist to find out, is this truly an allergy? Do, do the symptoms fit into an ideology? Or is it something else that is going on? Right. Okay. And that is, again, there you go back to, like, is it lactose? Is it non-IgE that is still persisting? Because non-IgE can persist throughout life. Yeah. You know, so is it a non-IgE that's still persisting that was never addressed properly? Uh, or does that person fall into one of those three states that I've spoken about before? Okay. That, those are the things to consider. Thank you. And... um when another question with a nut allergy would you test yearly or will they not grow out my little girl with milk allergy also allergic to peanut and hazelnut the one with the, who was four who had the reaction to yogurt okay Bye. so uh, again normally those children i don't test them yearly if the, the test was very high i probably test the first time test the first time see how big it is test it one year afterwards and after that, if it's still high, then probably every two or three years, because then the likelihood of outgrowing is minimal. Uh, and normally the main reason why we test it or keep on testing is mainly to see if there has been the development of new sensitivities or new allergies for us to then decide, does that child need uh, an adrenaline auto-injector or not? Because that is the main thing. So we need to think about quality of life but also the risks involved in the algae that the child has. Right. So that is the reason why I do it. Otherwise, if, if it is already proven that as an algae, there's already an action plan, there's already adrenaline and all that, I discharge it because right. nothing is going to change. And the only thing that I, that I write on the letter that I sent to the GP is when a child reaches this age and that age change to 300 micrograms, 500 micrograms, uh, adrenaline, uh, so and and ask us to change the action plan because an action plan needs to change be changed accordingly. But otherwise, there's no point in keep on submitting the child to skin prick test because nothing is going to change. One millimeter higher, one millimeter lower makes no difference whatsoever. I think uh, Kirsty says thank you. I think you've got a very comprehensive um, answer, Kirsty. So thank you. Now I want to ask because. Obviously, working with uh, you know different doctors, some people will go straight to do a blood test. What, why is it that some people do skin prick tests and some people do blood tests? When will you do a blood test? Well, uh, some of the answers to that could be sarcastic, some others are not. I would say I would just leave it to it is personal choice. Right. But my personal choice, based on evidence, is that blood tests and the two years of age bring a high rate of false positives. So I do not do blood tests. The only reasons when I do blood tests is that if there's a significant history of food causing reaction in immediately and the skin prick test comes back negative, then I think, is this a problem with the reagent? Is the child not reacting appropriately to the reagent? And I do a blood test to either confirm or deny the initial result because what what happens is testing in allergies is some is about something called the positive predictive value mm -hmm. and if we do two tests the positive predictive value increases especially if the two tests are the same okay so both of them are negative or both of them are positive so the positive predictive value so meaning that the true result is higher if i do the two tests so only in that condition I will do it. Otherwise, no. Skin prick test. Right. I, I just I find it fascinating how everyone works so differently, isn't it? Um, when it uh, you know, what is interesting is that um, there, there are guidances uh, about what to do and not to do. Uh, and, and for instance, as you know, I'm, I'm part of the, the Standard of Care Committee in the BSACI, so we write the national guidelines on allergy, being it for adults or for children. Yes. And we issue, we, it, it takes years, people don't even imagine the, the amount of work that we have to issue a guideline. Sometimes it takes around two years to issue a guideline because the amount of research that we go through, what we read papers-wise, 
is is quite intensive. Uh, so we there are specific guidance of what to test and what and what not to test, and at what age do should we do what? There are specific guidances, and that there's a, a small uh, book about skin prick test that says all that. So most of the information about skin prick test is based on the small book that is that is there. I have it there somewhere. So there are guidance. So why do people fall that decide to follow that guidance, and why do people decide not to follow that guidance? Right. Yeah, is that is their choice? Is some people doing allergy? that are unaware of those guidances? Yes, there are. There, there are, and that, that is no doubt. Uh, okay, so I prefer to stick to what I like to do and what is based on research yes. and, and not. Yes, definitely. Okay, there are some more questions, um, Dr. Costa. So mm -hmm. we'll finish, I think, after this, because it's quarter to nine. Uh, where does time <laughs> go? We're having fun, isn't it? These are lovely questions. Yes. I don't know if I'm too late, but how relevant is the size of SPT results in children? I thought it relates, it's related to likelihood of reaction rather than indication of severity. Okay. So first of all, let's, let's start with one important thing. <clears throat> the size of a reaction changes. So normally when someone has a skin pick test, we say that 0, 1, and 2 is a negative result and 3 and above is a positive result. Okay, but this changes slightly because children up to one year of age and there are papers that recommend until two years of age, we say that zero and one is negative and two is positive. This is mainly for under one years of age. So this, this just shows that the child's reactivity to a skin pretest will change with life. And that has to do with complex mechanisms about mast cell degranulation and all that. We'll, we'll leave it for some other time, not now. Otherwise, I'll bore people to that. Uh, <laughs> so... What what does this mean? A size. Uh, you're going to see. I've seen people that have very very big wheels, and the reaction is minimal, and the other way around. So the wheel is not going to tell me the severity of reaction, as as that person said, is going to tell me the likelihood of the reaction. Yes. Now what we know also at wheel size of eight and above, and especially this test was done for, if I'm not mistaken, peanuts, walnuts. And I don't know if it was egg. A size of eight or above will tell me the possibility of that child failing a food challenge. And some people have extrapolated that number to say that this is the risk of having anaphylaxis. Not really, but that increases the risk of anaphylaxis from eight and above. Yes, it does. But there is no specific size that I can say, oh, this child will have an anaphylaxis if he has a food or not. There's no such study being done. People try to do it, but it is completely dismissed because they could not reach a conclusion. Gosh, I think we we need some posts about this because this again would would you know cause someone to eliminate a food from a child's diet unnecessarily. It always comes back to that, doesn't it, Mr. Costa? And, and and that is why one of the things that I like to do very very often is, especially when the wheel is is small, a, a three or a four. I often like to bring the child to do a food challenge, especially if the initial uh, reaction was either minimal mm -hmm. or we are in doubt of what it is. I prefer, instead of going and doing blood tests, I prefer to bring the child and do a food challenge. Because again, as I said, 100% accurate. But also, another thing that is going to be helpful, even if the child does not pass the food challenge, it will tell me what is the threshold of reaction. And parents sometimes just with that will know that, okay, either it's a very high threshold, there's a very low threshold, and it, it, it gives them like this comforting level, let's yeah. put it this way. Peace of mind. So, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a peace of mind. Yes. I hope that answered your question, um, Kel. Uh, and Allergy Dad says, our child is six months was tested for allergies. He had infected eczema. Blood test said 30 allergies, some confirmed as positive with SPF. Do you think false positives likely? Ooh. Very likely. Very likely. Very likely. Because first of all, having infected eczema means that the total IgE, so IgE is the main immunoglobulin that mediates allergic reactions. 
uh, and IgE is actually the, the protein that least exists in the immune system. So infected eczema is one of the reasons why IgE becomes extremely elevated. And by becoming extremely elevated, any test that you're going to do on that child is going to be already raised. So the potential for false negative even increases further uh, in comparison to the ones that don't have uh, infected eczema and are under two years of age. So I'll take that with a pinch of salt. I'll control the eczema. And when the eczema is under control, I would repeat skin prick tests. Gosh, that must be really hard, um, Allergy Dad, who also says, how do we manage our position? We are told allergies. If we ignore and go ahead and introduce and he reacts, yeah. What, so my, what, my advice when a child that has quite extensive eczema, my priority is not introducing allergens. My priority is putting the, the, the eczema under control because yeah. we know that one of the reasons why a lot of children develop an allergy is because of skin contact, because there's non-existent skin barrier. And we know that an allergen, when it touches the skin, it leads, potentially, leads to sensitivity and allergy, while the oral route leads to tolerance. Okay, so in a child with extensive eczema and infected, as, as Father was saying, I, I would simply would not go and introduce allergens into that child's diet. I would control the eczema. When the eczema is under control, then introduce allergens or uh, do skin prick tests again and so on and so forth. But that is the path to go. Do not think about introducing allergens straight away with such bad eczema. Yeah. Actually, I wouldn't even do, do skin prick tests with the infected eczema oh, no. because the risk. You know, for us to do a skin prick test, you need healthy skin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If there is no healthy skin, the potential of the reagent getting into systemic circulation and causing an epilepsis is very high. But also, can also lead to sensitization that we are trying to prevent. And that is why you also say any moisturizers that anyone uses on a child with eczema need to be allergen free, along with alcohol free and perfume free. Okay, yeah. so there's quite a few things that need to be done before we talk about allergens in that child. Completely agree. And you know what, Energy Dad, I have a blog about eczema and also not just about food, but how you can manage the environment uh, at home. So I'll, I'll DM you that later. Um, okay, so, and so sorry, by the way, I think I just, my heart goes out to, you know, kids with eczema, it's so hard. And if it's, bleeding and it's really hard to manage isn't it it needs, it needs to be controlled so, before yeah. before anything at all yeah um where can i find guidelines to back up skin prick tests consultant only does blood tests says it's same as skin prick should we is, uh, that, is that the bisaki gotcha. so the, the bisaki will have guidelines on, on allergy testing yes uh, some of those guidances are available to the general public. Some others are available for professionals only. Uh, so for that, it would need a login. But there is published research about that. Uh, and uh, recently, well, recently, a couple of years ago, there's um, a consultant in St. Mary's, Bob, Bob Boyle, was actually addressing that issue. And he was questioning, why do people keep on doing blood tests when all the research points that he brings a lot of false negatives? And Bob Boyle, for people that know what meta-analysis is, he's probably one of the world's leading experts on meta-analysis uh, uh, because he publishes loads of them. And the meta-analysis is when the people put, pick up several researches and put it into just one data to get a better uh, idea of what is going on to the subject that is searching. And so Bob Boyle does that, and he, Bob Boyle has looked into uh, the difference between uh, skin prick test allergies and food allergies. So oh, sorry, maybe, and, and blood tests. So maybe we can uh, DM uh, this lady uh, some some guidance. Do you think we can? Uh, I'll, I'll have to go and look for them. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. But I, I, I'll, I'll make sure Everyone that needs something, I will make sure you're all DM'd with the additional resources. Um, yeah, so. uh, we, we can try and find it. As I said, a lot of this research is, um, is restricted. is restricted for healthcare professionals. So, for instance, the, the place where I go 
and look for 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 the latest publications are things like the MCBI, uh, Medscape. Uh, so for you to read certain other things, you need to be a healthcare professional. You need to be registered with them. So if some someone can get access to the MCBI or even to um, what's called the 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 Cochrane, the Cochrane da database. The Cochrane database very often has all that as well. Okay. Okay. Um, we might as well go on to nine o'clock, Dr. Costa. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, how long? Until we wrap it off. <laughs> yes. Camilla says, how long do non-IG mediated reactions go on for? Baby has diarrhea after step one of soya ladder, but still has, has it one week on. So wondering if maybe it was re related and e.g. a tummy bug. Uh, unlikely. Unlikely. Unlikely to be related. Unlikely to be related. N normally, we expect reactions <clears throat> up to 72 hours afterwards. Of course, gut, gut symptoms can persist a little bit longer if there's a significant inflammation associated. But we're talking about a significant inflammation. And that significant inflammation can sometimes persist for four to six weeks. But as soon as the food is, is uh, removed, I would expect the symptoms to start decreasing. I would not expect the symptoms to continue being the same. Because, you know, if the allergen is not there, the trigger for the reaction is not there. Mm -hmm. So in that case, if it's still persisting, we need to look at something else and not the food allergy. Right. Okay. Thank you. I hope that answers your question, Camilla. Please ask if it has, um, if it has not. <laughs> that was great. Thank you, says Cal. Um, and I think, I think that's it. I think. Uh, let me check the other side as well. No, that was really, I mean, wow, so informative. Thank you. Uh, and, and people, people, just a, a final note. People need to remember one thing. And despite, I've heard other healthcare, other healthcare professionals or specialists in the area saying that milk allergy is not the highest, uh, in, has not the highest incidence of food allergy in the world. That is not true. Uh, and if you go and see the World uh, Allergy Organization's post on that one, and based on things like the Euro Prevail says that no, by far, by far, milk allergy is the most common food allergy in the world. Yeah. Um, the most common allergy is not food, it's pollen allergy. Just, just a matter of curiosity. But the most common food allergy in the world is, uh, is milk. By, by a long, long distance. If I'm not mistaken, I think it's egg that is in second, three nuts, fourth, third, and, uh, and peanut fourth, something like that. So, but uh, uh, milk, yeah, by far, the, the main food allergy around. Sorry, I'm laughing because people are so lovely. And Kirsty says, thanks again, please do more. Could listen all night. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> no, honestly, I could talk all day as well. I, I mean... To me, I mean, sorry, Dr. Costa, but you know, it's lovely, isn't it? We we, we could have another chat in a in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, I based mean, on theologies again. Questions. If people have ideas for topics, put them in the comment because you know we we try and obviously meet your needs as the audience. So if you have any any great topic, then please let us know. Okay, yeah, last is. question because it's eight fifty seven. Claire yeah. says, I had a dairy allergy when younger. My son, who is three, has now outgrown his dairy allergy, but he still has egg allergy, anaphylaxis. I'm currently pregnant. Any advice? Uh, well, if, if she's not allergic to anything at all, eat everything. Do not restrict your diet. Yes. Yes, Claire. <laughs> you could be missing out on key nutrients as a you know, as a pregnant lady. And, 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 and recently there's been a study published a few months ago uh, done by Karina Venter, and I don't know if Rosen, Rosen was involved on that one as well, that again proved, uh, was asked Karina, that showed again that mothers should not restrict their diet during pregnancy. Yes. Because otherwise the risk of, of developing, the child developing allergies is higher. So do not have food restrictions. Yes, Claire. And, and may I add to that? Because uh, I do have a paper, um, a blog where I've written about 
the importance of mothers, mothers to be to look after your microbiome as well. So I'll do my best, remember all of you, and DM you that link so you can have In that case, Mediterranean diet is the best. Mediterranean <laughs> diet all the way. <laughs> so but actually, it has been proven as well. Yes. I mean, Mediterranean diet is, has been proven in so many other clinical conditions, isn't it? Diabetes, yeah. heart disease. So, Absolutely. Um, but thank you so much. That was lovely. You're very welcome, Nishti. Uh, thank you for your time. And we'll, I'm sure we can do another one in a few weeks. Maybe, yeah. Definitely. I'm think of a topic now, but I'm sure it will come. <laughs> oh, there, there's always something that we can talk about. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Nishi. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, I'll for being here. On the, on the feed for everyone to, to re-watch. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching.